Hello, everybody. Thanks very much for coming today uh, for Cloud Foundry Open for Tokyo. We're very excited to be here. This is the third leg of the Cloud Foundry Open Tour. We've been to uh, um, Beijing and Shanghai last week, and today we're in Tokyo. Tokyo is very special in Cloud Foundry because there is a very strong developer community uh, with the Cloud Foundry meetup here. So first, I'd like to know who in the audience is part of the Cloud Foundry Tokyo meetup. Okay, um, so today I'm going to give you a talk about uh, Cloud Foundry, a developer perspective. So this is about, um, um, so it's about Cloud Foundry as a platform, as a service, and then I'll show you a sample applications that Mark Lukowski, who's VP of Engineering for Cloud Foundry, created that shows the strength of the platform. So Cloud Foundry as a platform, as a service, you may have heard the term before. Platform as a service is one level up from infrastructure as a service. It raises the level of abstraction from uh, infrastructure as a service. It, instead of uh, dealing with machines and, and servers uh, and disks and, and bandwidth, you're dealing with applications and instances. So Cloud Foundry, we call it an open platform as a service. Because it's an open source project, uh, it's under the Apache 2 license, which means that you can take the code, it's on GitHub, and make whatever you want with it. So you can create your own company, uh, create a, pl a public platform as a service, uh, service company with it, or you can use it internally. You don't need to ask VMware for anything. Uh, then it's infrastructure neutral. So Cloud Foundry runs on any infrastructure uh, as a service layer which means you can make Cloud Foundry run on top of vSphere. That's what we're doing at VMware. Uh, but you can also make it run on top of Amazon Web Services or OpenStack or whatever infrastructure layer you have chosen to use. Another part of it is that Cloud Foundry is um, extensible in terms of runtimes. So by default, Cloud Foundry ships with uh, Node.js, um, Ruby, Spring applications, uh, Scala, uh, Scala and, and others, but the open source community have added support for other languages and frameworks like Erlang, and I've even seen someone doing small talk uh, on top of Cloud Foundry. It's also extensible in terms of services, so it's multi-framework and multi-service. By default, there's Postgres, MongoDB, Redis, MySQL, RabbitMQ, but people have added Neo4j, um, even there's a Japanese developer called Oza who have added support for Memcached in the open source repository. So if there is a service you want to use, you can very well add it yourself. That's the beauty of having an open source platform as a service. Then in terms of cloud, Cloud, cloud Foundry is a multi-cloud platform as a service, which means that it runs on your own infrastructure. You can create your private cloud with it. It runs in fully managed public platform as a services like AppFog or CloudFoundry.com that is hosted by VMware. But it, it can also run on your laptop. So I have a virtual machine here running what we call Micro Cloud Foundry. So Micro Cloud Foundry is a version of Cloud Foundry that runs on your laptop that you can use for development and that has all the platforms and services that are part of Cloud Foundry. So in terms of... Uh, so I, I told you about Cloud Foundry is a project. You need to differentiate the project itself that can be used by many types of companies from cloudfoundry.com, which is VMware's way of delivering Cloud Foundry. So at VMware, we have three ways of delivering Cloud Foundry. The open source project, so you can get our bits on GitHub. It's Apache 2 license. Many developers have gotten that and created their own cloud uh, with uh, open source bits. But you can also use Micro Cloud Foundry, which you can download from the cloudfoundry.com service, and then you can run it on either Fusion on Mac, VMware Fusion on Mac, or VMware Player, or Workstation on PC. And then you have cloudfoundry.com, which is the public pass operated by VMware. In terms of key abstractions that Cloud Foundry makes available to you, there's uh, applications, so the application is really the unit on which you're working, what you're building, the code that you're writing. So you write an application, 
and then you push it to the cloud. Then there are instances. Instances are pretty much the equivalent in cloud platform uh, to what processes are when you're coding an application uh, on a local PC operating system. So in the old way of doing things, you would manage processes. Here you manage instances. So you're pushing an application and then you tell the platform, hey, my application has lots of users. I need 10 or 100 instances uh, running for it. Then you have services. Services are typically the backend services that you're using in your application. And a very common way of building applications in the cloud space is to build your own services and APIs and compose an application out of several services. And I'll show you an example of doing that. So in Cloud Foundry, you access these services and you can provision them on demand and bind them to the application that you have created. And then, usually in an operating system, the way you as a developer interact with the operating system is through a shell. The equivalent of the shell in Cloud Foundry is a command line called VMC. VMC is a command line that uses uh, the REST API that Cloud Foundry exposes, and you can use that REST API from whatever language you want. At VMware, we have packaged that into a, a command line written in Ruby called VMC. Uh, that you can use uh, to access all the control API surface of the platform as a service that you're using. So let's get back to basic examples. I'm pretty sure many of you have started programming using the classic hello world example. And if you're like me, if you started coding 20 years ago, there's a good chance that your first hello world was in C, something like that, hello world.c. So you would include a library for doing I.O. and then you would say printf hello world. And in order to use that, you would, do, you would compile it, uh, your, your .c file, and then you would just run it on the local operating system. So that, that's hello world on classic uh, operating systems. Hello world in the cloud would look like that. So this is hello world in Ruby. So you're writing that Ruby file you're using something called Ruby Gems, which is the equivalent of C libraries. And here we're using a very simple framework for building web applications in Ruby that is called Sinatra. And in that Sinatra application, we're going to add a hit count to our hello world because it's a web application. Uh, and then when you get slash on the application, we're going to increment the hit count and then print hello world and then how many people have hit that page. Once you've done that, instead of compiling, you're doing a VMC push. That means push my application to the cloud where I can start running it. Once you've done VMC push, you can do HTTP get in your browser to your application and you will get hello world uh, with a hit count. Now you share your very nice public cloud application with tens of your friends and that works well, but let's say it becomes viral from one day to the other. Every one of them who likes you just share, share that on Mixi and um, share that on Mixi and then lots of people, millions of people are coming to your application. You need to scale it up. And that's what the cloud provides you, the way to scale up your application on demand. So this is what the hello world uh, scaled up would look like. You would do VMC instances and bump up the number of instances for your application to 10. So that means there's now 10 different backends running your application in parallel. And every time a request comes in, it would go to a load balancer that would balance, the balance it to a different uh, instance. But now the problem is that this dollar hit variable that is incremented by one, this variable is only in the process of a single instance. So then every time you would be load balanced to a different instance, you would have a different hit counter. So that doesn't work. In order to scale it, you need to start using a backend service. In this case, we're going to use the Redis key value store, and we're just going to do a VMC create service Redis. Uh, so we call the, we're, we're creating a, a Redis service, and we're going to bind that service to the Hello World application. And we just need to modify one line in our code. Instead of doing a dollar hit plus one, we're just using Redis increment operator to increment the hit count. And then we're reporting that. Now in terms of VMC command line, as I told you, 
VMC allows you to access the whole control surface of the control API for Cloud Foundry. What does it look like? Once you have installed Cloud Foundry or VMC on your machine, you can do that using um, uh, gem install VMC. If you do VMC help, uh, you'll see that. And on that page, you have the whole control surface of Cloud Foundry. It's pretty simple. So you have a few, a few commands that deal with applications, how to update and control an app. So you do VMC push to push an application from your local machine to the cloud. And, and push is pretty smart. What, what push is doing is that it's looking at the differences between what you have. Uh, no, so, so VMC push to, to push the application. Then, then there's VMC update that lets you update an application once you've modified it locally. Update is pretty smart. Update is looking at the differences between what's online and what you have on your local machine and just ships these differences instead of pushing the whole, for example, the whole WAR file. It's just going to ship the differences. Uh, then you have start and stop, and VMC target is used to target a specific Cloud Foundry endpoint. When you're developing, you may want to target uh, your micro Cloud Foundry instance that runs on your local machine, so it has a, a specific API endpoint, or you may want to target uh, api.cloudfoundry.com that's hosted by VMware, or maybe another API endpoint at AppFog or within your private firewall uh, cloud. So changing the target allows you to talk to different clouds that are all based on Cloud Foundry. And that's the beauty of having uh, first a REST API and then uh, an open source implementation uh, for, uh, uh, for your pass. You can talk to multiple different clouds using the same tools. To give you an example of that, recently AppFog, which is one of the companies building a public pass on top of Cloud Foundry, they released an, an iPad app to manage your cloud apps on AppFog. Now you can change the API endpoint on that iPad app and start managing the same apps on cloudfoundry.com as well. So you can change app settings with VMC mem to change the memory. You can map an application to another URL. You can bump up or, or down the number of instances. You can access the crash logs and the logs of an application with VMC uh, uh, logs. You can access files in the applications. And then there's a bunch of commands uh, that let you deal with services and users. So you can create a service and bind it to an application with create service and bind service. You can unbind a service, you can delete a service, and then there's all the commands to create a user, login, uh, etc. So as you see, the control surface of Cloud Foundry is a pretty simple set of commands uh, to learn. So now that you know what Cloud Foundry is about, let's look at the sample applications that would have been very difficult to build in the old style of computing, and that becomes much easier to build in this new style when you're leveraging the strength of a platform as a service. So this app was built by Mark Lukowski, who's the VP of engineering for the Cloud Foundry team. He built this app in one week, and this app is using different languages. The goal of this application is to be a load generation system for the Cloud Foundry team to be able to test Cloud Foundry itself, to load test the system. So what this app is doing is that essentially it's going to like load test over HTTP some application that are loaded on Cloud Foundry, and it's going to do some load testing on VMC commands as well. So the way it's built, uh, the whole front end is built in jQuery and jQuery UI, so it's a HTML5 uh, front end application using Haml for templating. So Haml is pretty well uh, used in Ruby. Uh, it's 100% JavaScript, uh, and then it's talking JSONP to uh, the, the front end on the server side, which is uh, two instances of 128 megabytes of a Sinatra application. So it's a Ruby Sinatra application. That front end itself is talking to a back end that's an API server. So as I told you, when you're building a cloud application, very often you want to like, make, make a strong distinction between your front end of your application and the back end itself. So the back end here is an API server, and the front end is talking to that API server through uh, uh, JSON over HTTP. And that API server itself is coded in Node.js. Node.js is a asynchronous framework for building JavaScript server-side application that's very close to the metal. It's very efficient, especially in terms of I.O. 
And so it's very suitable for writing either protocol handlers or API servers. So here our API server is coded in, um, in Node.js, in JavaScript. And then we are using Redis as the message queue. So when you need a message queue, you can use either Redis if you want your message queue to be, um, if you don't need your message queue to be durable, if you want it to be durable, uh, you should use RabbitMQ. So in that case, because it's a load testing system, we're just going to use Redis. So the API server is using rpush to push some uh, work items uh, on the queue in Redis. And then we have two pools of workers, VMC workers, who are exercising the VMC commands against the Cloud Foundry system, trying to load test it. So they're issuing tons of VMC commands very, very quickly. And because VMC, the command line is written in Ruby, there's a, it is based on a gem, a Ruby gem called VMC, that you can use in your own application. So that application, the VMC worker, is coded in Ruby using the VMC gem. So it's also a Sinatra application. And what it's using is that it's using the BL pop operation to get some work items from the Redis queue. On the other side, for HTTP testing, we're using a Node.js application. And actually, we're using uh, the same uh, instances as the API server. So that's what we call the HTTP workers here. So the workers are just pulling some work items from the queue and then just uh, pushing it back to Redis, pushing back status to Redis. Once you've built this application, so here you can see there's at least two different languages that you're using, different parts of the system that have different memory requirements and uh, are, that are using different uh, frameworks. How do you push that? In the old days, in order to build such a system, you would have spent literally weeks in ticket hell. You would have logged some tickets against your system administration's team to provision VMs or even to provision bare metal for installing each and every part of that system. And that would have taken weeks. Uh, if you're using Cloud Foundry, the deployment instructions are two lines. You just CD to the directory where your code is and you do VMC push. Now, how does VMC knows all the stuff that I just described on the previous diagram. That's because VMC has this very nice uh, characteristics where it can pick up a file called manifest.yaml. And this manifest file uh, in, in YAML syntax, you're going to describe all the components that your app is, comp that your system is comprised about, uh, of. And here, we are really talking about a system. So we have a set of applications we specify here their name, the number of instances we want, uh, the memory for each of them, the type of runtime. So you can see we have uh, two Ruby 1.8 runtimes and one Node, uh, Node 0.6 runtime. The URL where they're going to be provisioned and the kind of services that need to be uh, provisioned for them. So here, uh, if you look at this YAML file, you can recognize wh what we had before, which is uh, we're going to have the HTTP workers at the beginning, which are uh, under a node runtime, and we want 16 instances of these. We have 96 instances of Ruby workers for the VMC workers. And then we have the Stack2 front-end, uh, which is a Ruby Sinatra application. How is this design? So typically, this is a producer-consumer uh, pattern. Uh, this is a very classic pattern, producer-consumer. You, you've probably seen that when you learned about design patterns. Many complex applications that are running within companies or even very scalable websites are based on this pattern. Producer-consumer is a very good way to scale a system. In the classic mode of building producer-consumer systems, you would have used thread pools or semaphores and the scalability was limited to the visibility of the work queue. In Cloud Foundry, we're using instance pools. So we use a set of instances of workers that are all pulling from the same queue. And we're using uh, Redis, AirPush, and BLPOP for, uh, our, for, for the message queue. We could use Rabbit if we wanted a durable queue. But here, we don't need that for that uh, load testing system. And then uh, it's fully horizontal, horizontally scalable, which means that 
If I want to test, to load test a bigger system, I can just raise the number of instances and it will work the same. So as I said, it's a producer-consumer pattern. It's using Node.js. Node.js is very performant uh, because it's doing asynchronous I.O. Uh, and also it's using the, the V8 uh, Chrome engine for, for JavaScript. And, and so Chrome V8 engine is very fast for executing JavaScript code. In order to debug our applications, very often we're going to want to talk to services that these applications are using. In many cloud providers, in order to talk to the backend services, you need to use some proprietary tools that they are offering. In Cloud Foundry, we have a very nifty feature called Caldecott that lets you create a tunnel between your local machine and the cloud service that you're using. So for example, if I provision a MySQL database with my application, with Caldecott, I just can do a VMC tunnel to that, the name of that database, and then I'm going to be able to use MySQL Workbench or whatever tools I prefer to manage the MySQL instance that's on the other side. So Caldecott and VMC Tunnel lets you use the tools you're, you're familiar with in order to manage services. Then we're using Redis sorted sets for stats collection. I'm going to show you the code for that. And Mark Lukowski has a very nice uh, trick using Redis expiring keys for rate calculations. Uh, the key here is that once you're starting to use a cloud platform that, that makes available to you lots of different services, knowing really in depth how these services work and what they can offer you, and using the best tool for the right job allows you to write much smaller code base for a pretty complex system. So let's look at the producer-consumer code how many of you have ever coded in JavaScript? Okay, so we have a few JavaScript developers here. Uh, so for those who know JavaScript, you'll be pretty familiar with that style of coding. For those of you who don't know JavaScript, ja JavaScript um, in JavaScript, functions are first order objects in the system. So you can pass functions uh, to another function as an argument. Uh, and that's done very often when you're uh, coding in asynchronous context in JavaScript. So you, you can see that kind of coding in Node.js where uh, a lot of the calls are event-driven and asynchronous. You can see that also on front-end JavaScript. If you do an, a view source on most AJAX applications, the DOM events uh, require that kind of callback functions. So the code we see here uh, is essentially the, the core of the producer-consumer system we talked about. It's, it's, very, um, it's very short. So here we're going to commit an item, a work item to the queue. Uh, so we have this function commit item, and what it's doing is doing a, reading, uh, a Redis R push. So we are pushing that item to the queue. And the Redis call, when you're doing a call to a service in Node.js, that call is asynchronous, which means the node thread is going to execute up to that call. It's going to do the R push, and then it's going to come back right away. And then in the meantime, there's a, a, a native POSIX thread that's going to take over that call. And then the, the, the node event loop continues. Uh, and, that, and that allows lots of other requests to be done while this Redis call uh, is executed. So then what happens in the back end is that the Redis call is executed, it comes back. And when it comes back, the callback function, which is this function or error data, is going to be called. So when the Redis call is ready, an event is going to be triggered in Node. And Node is going to say, hey, this guy had registered this function to be called when my data comes back. So here, my function is called with the data that's back. And uh, if there's some data, and uh, if there's like too much, if it's larger than the, the size of the queue, we're going to trim the queue. And then we have the function uh, worker that's just doing a, a BL pop on the queue to get some, some work items uh, to be done. And once these work items are coming back, they will be passed in data, and we're going to call do work uh, on the data items. And so the, the data items here are just arrays with two elements in them. 
the first one is the queue and the second one is the item uh, that you need to do. So here we're just pulling the item out of the array and we're calling do work for this. And do work again is going to execute in an asynchronous way and then we're calling process next tick to just uh, let the worker uh, or let node continue to execute some other uh, worker um, uh, jobs. So that's how the producer consumer uh, system is working. Now, how do we do, um, um, so how do you do the HTTP API server? So this again is a, a pretty short, uh, this is a Node.js server. So in Node.js, it's pretty easy to create your own web server. So this is a web server that's strictly designed to answer these two routes, the ones that we have there. So we can call this server with HTTP or VMC. So again, that's the API server that is going to be called. And what we pass in there in, in the routes, um, so routes is a hash map. We're passing to it the name of the route and then uh, a command. So either HTTP command or VMC command. These commands are functions uh, that are defined uh, somewhere else. And what we do in order to create um, a, a server uh, in Node is we're, we're first going to create this Redis client object that's, that's talking to Redis. And then on request, so on request is, um, is going to receive request on response. That's pretty much like servlets uh, in Java. So you're going to receive a request object that has all the parameters and a response object. We're going to look inside the request and look for the path. And based on the path, we're going to look, look up in that hash map table which function we should be calling. And then we're calling that function with a request and response. And these functions will be able to do uh, the calls for HTTP or for VMC. And then after that, we're just, uh, uh, if there's no, if someone is calling our server with some other routes, we're sending them a 404 because these are all the routes that we implement in there. And then at the end, we say, we just, use the HTTP module. So before that, there should be a require HTTP. In the HTTP module, it knows how to create a server. And on that server, we're going to listen to a port that is uh, provided to us by Cloud Foundry. So essentially, that's uh, one page to just create a, a custom server in Node.js. Now, that's Mark's way of creating a server. It's, it's pretty low level. In Node, you have the whole choice of going very low level, a little bit higher level with a, a set of middleware called Connect, or there's a higher level framework that's inspired by Sinatra that's called uh, Express. Personally, when I create uh, apps, uh, web servers, I prefer to use Express instead of dealing with all, all that low level stuff myself. But you have the choice. That's the beauty of Node. Now let's look at the BLPOP server. Uh, so here uh, we're doing, uh, so we're having a boot function and then um, uh, where we have all our uh, instance variable with the BLPOP Redis and the status Redis and the CF instance, uh, which is our Cloud Foundry, uh, Cloud Foundry instance. And this is the worker function that if you remember was called uh, uh, before. So here the, the essence of what we're doing is uh, so we're, we're doing a BL pop on the queue. Uh, so, we, we, so that means it's a blocking pop. So we're going to block on that call, uh, on that queue. And until there's some work for us, we're going to pop items from that queue. Once there's some work coming for us, we're going to call that function with error and data, and we're going to do some work with it. And then we're calling process.nextStick. Now, let's say I have started running my system with maybe two instances locally just to test it. And I want to see how it's doing. So I'd like to look at all these Redis queues and see whether that works or not. So here I can use VMC tunnel uh, to the Redis that I have, to the Redis instance that, that I have created. And I tell it, please use the Redis client uh, for that uh, tunneling. And so Caldecott is just creating a tunnel between my local machine uh, and uh, the, the, the cloud-based Redis system. And here, once I'm at the prompt, I can really interact using the Redis, um, uh, Redis syntax uh, to just do some queries in there. So here I'm looking at all the keys that are in my staging system. 
So I can look at the keys for uh, the staging operations, for, for, um, for workers and things like that. And uh, with Z-Range, I can look at the content of these keys. So essentially, VMC Tunnel allows you to interact with your database, maybe do some database upgrades uh, directly from your local system using the tools you are used to use uh, in order to develop and debug systems. Now, one of the nice tricks of, um, uh, of this application is how it's, do the, how it's doing um, st statistics collections. So in order to collect stats about how much all these HTTP calls uh, that the load testing system is doing and the VMC call that it's doing, Mark is using a pretty smart uh, naming convention where he's using Redis keys with a specific naming convention like VMC and then the cloud uh, variable and then some actions and the list of actions in there. And he's using these keys uh, in Redis uh, in order to record some data about how much uh, stuff takes. So here what you can see, when we log an action, so we have a log action method here, and all these st statistic collection is just based on, oh, actually, did I? Yeah, yeah, that's it. So all these statistics are just based on uh, uh, like this line of code here uh, with this lo log action. So here I pass to it an action and then an, elap an elapsed time bucket so in order to compute statistics, I'm, I'm, um, um, I'm, doing, uh, I, I'm, I'm setting the times into different time buckets, things that take uh, 50 milliseconds or, or one millisecond. So we pass an action and then the which elapsed time bucket it's belonging to. Uh, and then I set some keys that are based on these elapsed time buckets and I store, uh, I increment, I, I, I use the Z increment by in Redis for that action key and for that uh, uh, time bucket in order to just uh, increment that key. So Redis has this notion of sorted sets where you can have not only a key, but you can have a set of keys that are sorted and that have value associated to them. And here we're using the increment by to increment the value every time there's an action that is in a specific time bucket. So for example, we're doing an HTTP call. Uh, we're just going to do log this action depending on the time it took, uh, it took to execute. We're going to assign it to a specific time bucket and we're just going to increment the, the record in Redis uh, for it. And, and that allows with a simple naming convention to just have all that data logged uh, in Redis uh, under these keys. And then when you're doing a Z range here, you can see that for login, we had uh, 212,000 uh, transactions. And then for info, we had 21293. And then uh, when, once we looked at the buckets, we are looking at the, all the actions that took uh, between 400 uh, milliseconds to one second. And we can look at how many there are. So there were lots of create apps. So there were 14 create app calls that were part of that time bucket. And then there were 75 bind service calls. So that, that so the, the Z range that we're using, we, we're doing a, a Caldecott tunnel and then we're doing a, um, a query within uh, Redis in order to see what these, uh, how these buckets were, were arranged and what kind of keys they were in there. So with all these data, then you're able to build a full user interface that shows you for each type of operation how many, uh, uh, how many were performed in which uh, time range. And then there's a nice, um, a nice uh, trick here for using Redis increment by and expire for rate calculation. And the trick here is that you're going to, uh, in order to compute the rates, uh, we're going to just use a, a, a key the same way that is the rate for the past second um, for, for the specific operation. So, so first we're cal calculating the time now and then we're creating a key in Redis and we're incrementing it by, uh, by one. But the thing is, we're also expiring it in 10 seconds, which means we're going to have these rates calculated on the fly, but after 10 seconds, Redis will just garbage collect, collect them for us. We're, so we're not filling Redis with 
lots of rate calculations that are uh, useless. Uh, and then when we want to re retrieve uh, the rate calculation uh, for a specific action, we're just doing a lookup of that key and, and getting uh, the value associated to it. So what the final app looks like uh, is something like this. And I think I have a... Oh, let me see. So what we see here is uh, this, um, this load testing system that, we're, that enge our engineering in Cloud Foundry is using in order to test Cloud Foundry. Uh, so what you see in there is uh, the list of actions on the left. Uh, so you have uh, all the VMC actions. And then you have the totals and the various buckets that we talked about, the actions that took less than uh, 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. Uh, we have the number of HTTP requests per second and the number of uh, Cloud Foundry API calls per second. Now, this number, 6,000 requests, uh, requests per second, uh, when Mark gave this talk in Shanghai, he explained that it happened to me to him only once uh, that he had that kind of um, that kind of throughput in his system. Uh, Six thousand requests per second is a very high number. Uh, it happened to him only once when he was doing the Ajax API at Google, and there was an issue uh, with a site in China that was making heavy calls to it, and that was very popular. So there, there's not a good not a lot of chance that you're going to you to need that kind of capacity. But that's the kind of capacity that we're testing in our system in order to make sure that CloudFoundry.com uh, is very scalable. And so that load testing system with just a few lines of node that I showed you, uh, and Ruby is just able to test our system with that kind of throughput using all the workers that we talked about. So it's a pretty efficient system. And then at the bottom, you see the number of workers that are running. And so all these, all these data are gathered in real time from the front-end client in JavaScript that's talking to the back-end API server, that's talking to Redis, doing the queries we talked about in order to get the various numbers in the buckets, the number of workers, and things like that. And I have a quick uh, video that shows that stuff in action. So let's take a look. So here, we're just... Starting, starting the system, and you can see that it's running against uh, staging and that the number of requests for VMC are starting to, to grow. And as you can see, the number of workers, as the number of requests are growing, the number of workers is growing there, and you end up with uh, something like uh, 180 uh, uh, calls per second, which is uh, uh, pretty big. And then it's just, it's just moving around uh, depending on, on the load and the workers are just pulling uh, queue, uh, tasks from the queues. And then we're changing to doing some tests on VMC to some tests of HTTP. And here it's going to load tons of workers or tons of uh, HTTP tasks uh, to the workers. And, and you can see that the number of workers is going to grow here and we're growing to 2,000, 2,000, and at the maximum we'll go to, uh, um, I think, 6,000 requests per second. So that kind of system, if you grow the number of workers in parallel, can really, you can really build very scalable system that, that can handle massive uh, loads. All right, so that was, a, that was a presentation that gave you an idea of what Cloud Foundry is, uh, why a polyglot approach is very interesting when you're building a distributed system where you want to use the right tool for the right job and by learning the various services that you can leverage in your platform as a service, you can be much more succinct in the code you're building while building systems that scale horizontally to vast numbers of users or huge volumes of data. Now, after that, uh, Chris Richardson is going to uh, give you a talk that's called Cloud Foundry Bootcamp, where he'll get more into the details of how to get started with Cloud Foundry. Thanks very much.